Each clan had its own separate gods and totems. To water and wind, fire and night. They were kept in the caravan town of Mecca, in a shrine of wood, stone and cloth. It was called the Kaaba, the Arabic word for cube. Pre-Islamic Arabs worshipped a number of spirits, and they were generally nature-oriented spirits, sometimes associated with natural, natural features like trees or rocks or springs. And uh, the Kaaba in Mecca was one of a number of these sanctuaries centered around a particular cluster of deities. It was said the Hebrew patriarch, Abraham himself, built the Kaaba centuries before and that a sacred black stone it held within had fallen from the sky. In these turbulent times, the Kaaba provided a rare place of peace. Only here would the Bedouin submit to a temporary truce before returning to their conflicts of the open sands. There was this one place in the middle around the Kaaba which was, from even pre-Islamic times, was a place of uh, a sacred enclosure where all people had to put down their arms. And this, of course, facilitated trading uh, because it meant that you couldn't carry on your feuds when you were doing your buying and selling. The spiritual and economic importance of the Kaaba and Mecca are pretty hard to separate in, in, as far as the pre-Islamic Arabs are concerned. The Kaaba made Mecca a vibrant center for trade. Here were found Arabian incense, exotic perfumes and Indian spices, Chinese silks and Egyptian linens. But perhaps the greatest treasure to be found at Mecca was the rich mixture of cultures. There were people who came through town who had all kinds of interesting experiences to relate to faraway places. The local religion was mixed. There were Christians, there were Jews, and there were also the Arabs of the desert who followed an animist type of religion. Muhammad's world was a center of trade, connecting the Mediterranean Sea to the Indian Ocean, linking the aging empires of Byzantium and Persia to the great bazaars of India and China. Muhammad became a merchant. In fact, he had a great flair for trade. At the age of 25, while leading a caravan northward to Syria, his talents caught the eye of the shipment's owner, a wealthy widow named Khadija. She was so taken with Muhammad, she proposed marriage. Ah, Khadija. Well, I think she was a mentor as well as a wife, a very strong lady who had her own business, and Muhammad was helping her out. So it was a wonderful partnership, and I'm sure he learned a lot from her. He had a tremendous amount of contact with merchants coming from different parts uh, of the world, passing through the Arabian Peninsula. I think he was a very intelligent man, very open-minded, and he was able to communicate with a great variety of peoples. He must have had great charisma as well. Mohammed had a way with people and with resolving their disputes. Once, when the Kaaba fell into disrepair, the clan chieftains quarreled over who would have the honor of putting the sacred black stone back where it belonged. Before violence could erupt, Mohammed proposed an equitable solution. United in the effort, the four leaders shared the weight and the honor. In gratitude, they invited Muhammad himself to replace the sacred stone. He became known as Al-Amin, the trusted one. 
there are all kinds of indications that he was tremendously interested in, in religious questions. This is obviously not something that an ordinary person probably was interested in in those days. He talked to uh, sages, Arab sages. He talked to Jewish and Christian sages who lived in the area. He used to go up into the rock hills around Mecca and meditate, think about things. And at some point had this extraordinary vision, which is spoken about very evocatively and elusively. In a cave above Mecca, Muhammad had an experience that would be the defining moment of his life. An angel was said to appear before him in the form of a man, instructing him to recite in the name of God, the Almighty. For Muhammad, it was an encounter as profound as it was deeply disturbing. You get a sense of what it would be like to be a normal person in society, perhaps unusual in the sense of your intensity for things like social justice and finding out what the meaning of life is, but not being uh, endowed with anything that would seem, seem miraculous by your friends. And all of a sudden having this voice come to you and then come out of you as you speak it and recite it to other people. And that is the beginning of the prophetic career of Muhammad. The months to come would bring more revelations. Powerful words of a lyrical quality, more beautiful than the most exquisite Arabic poetry. Above all, Muhammad was to bear one message to his people, a simple yet radical proclamation, that there is only one God. The central tenet of Islam is the oneness, the indivisible unity of God, uh, not something that is simply, uh, that one pays lip service to, but something that is absolutely the most important concept. Divine unity is more than saying God is, there's only one God and there aren't other, other deities. It's only thinking about one thing. So to be thinking about possessions, to be thinking about status, to be thinking about power, are all intellectual idols. The implications were staggering. One God meant one people. No more tribal divisions. To the poor and unprotected, the prospect was revolutionary. It seems to me that one of the most important things of, in his early teaching that isn't, isn't often talked about is the strong social justice message that he delivered. In Mecca of the time, there was an increasing separation between the haves and the have-nots. He insisted that it, this was not to be and that we should share the wealth and uh, it was this social justice message that I think that really got him a hearing among many of the folks. So coming with Islam, it was a new order, a new way of life. And it was a beautiful way of life because everybody was equal, black, white, men, women, children. So it had that type of uh, universal appeal, which I think was the reason why Islam spread so rapidly. Many were moved by Muhammad's message as he began to speak out in the community. It had the suppleness and symbolic depth of the great pre-Islamic poems that had been created by this people and that had given this people in Arabia such an extraordinary ear for verbal expression, where verbal expression was the commanding cultural force. Some people called him a poet. And there's a Quranic uh, surah basically saying, uh, Muhammad is not a poet. Poets speak through desire. Uh, this is not the voice of desire. This is the voice of God. Muhammad's following began to grow. They called themselves 
Muslims, for those who surrender to God. They set out to preserve the message Muhammad had brought. This was the beginning of the Quran. The Quran was revealed orally, but very soon people realized that it had to be written down in order to make sure that it wasn't corrupted and that the original message was maintained. And from a very early date, and it's, it's very unclear when that date was, because no early manuscripts of the Quran survive, people began copying it down. The Quran is a revelation of spiritual teaching, of both ethical and social guidance. It was revealed and remains.